Hello, my name is Dr. Ilan Goldenberg. I'm uh, the director of the Clinical Cardiovascular Research Center at the University of Rochester. And in the, today I would like to present our findings from our study, prospective study that we conducted here at the University of Rochester on the association of sex hormones and cardiac repolarization dynamics during the menstrual cycle in women with congenital and drug-induced long QT syndrome. I will begin with a brief background. As we all know, women who have congenital long QT syndrome experience increased risk for cardiac events after the onset of adolescence and also during the postpartum and perimenopausal periods. In contrast, the risk of cardiac events among LKTS males is attenuated after the onset of adolescence. And those opposing trends may possibly be due to the known modulating effects of sex hormones on the cardiac potassium channels, especially the HERC channel that is associated with LKT2, with the LKT2 genotype, and drug-induced long QT syndrome. We also know that estrogen and progesterone levels fluctuate during the regular menstrual cycle. We therefore hypothesize that those regular menstrual fluctuations of sex hormones may affect cardiac repolarization dynamics, and importantly, the propensity for ventricular arrhythmia in women who have congenital and drug-induced long QT syndrome. Accordingly, the primary aim of the present study was to evaluate the association of cardiac repolarization dynamic with ECG parameters and sex hormone levels during the menstrual cycle in women with congenital long QT syndrome, as well as in women who are treated with QT prolonging drugs. I will begin a little, to give a little background on the study design and then we'll go to the key findings. So in this study, we prospectively enrolled 105 women in the age range of 18 to 50 years who had a regular menstrual cycle and were not described exogenous sex hormones. This included congenital LKTS women, unaffected family relative, women who are treated with sotolol or the fetolide, drug-induced long QT syndrome, and, and healthy controls. And all, the, all women underwent seven then continuous ECG recordings three times during the menstrual cycle, beginnings on days 3, 13, and 22. And on the first day of each of those recording cycles, we also obtained some saliva testing of sex hormones on the first day of those recording cycles. And now I'll go to the main findings. First of all, we identified that among women with LKTS, especially LKT2, QTC values that are a marker of arrhythmic risk peaked during the early phase of the menstrual cycle and declined thereafter. And those trends were not observed among unaffected family members. Importantly, those trends of QTC reduction during the menstrual cycle, especially in women with LKT2, were inversely related to the trends that we observed for progesterone and the progesterone to estradiol ratio, which increased during the menstrual cycle. And consistently, we identified multiple inverse correlations between ECG parameters and sex hormone levels in women with LKT2. We showed that progesterone levels are inversely related to QTC, suggesting that an increase in the progesterone levels and the progesterone to estradiol ratio during the menstrual cycle is associated with significant QTC reduction in women with LKT2 thereby possibly reducing the propensity for ventricular arrhythmia in women with LKT2. We also observed inverse correlation between estradiol and the RR ratio, suggesting that an increase in estrogen during the menstrual cycle is associated with increased heart rates in women with LKT2, suggesting that this actually an increase in estradiol rate levels during the menstrual cycle may increase the propensity for ventricular arrhythmia in women with LKT2. And we also observed that the testosterone levels were inversely related to T-wave duration, which is also a marker of arrhythmic risk in LKTS, suggesting that L testosterone may be protective against arrhythmia in women, women with LKT2. Importantly, the trends that we observed in women with LKT2 were not evident in unaffected family members in women with LKT1, but they were evident and statistically significant in women who were treated 
with QT belonging drugs. Again, the same trend we observed and the same correlation with the progesterone to estradiol ratio that was inversely related to QTC, suggesting that an increase in the progesterone to estradiol ratio in women who are treated with QT prolonging drug is associated with a significant QT reduction. We identified important genotype specific correlation of cardiac operalization dynamics with sex hormone levels during the menstrual cycle. And this may affect the propensity for ventricular tachyarrhythmia in women with LKT2 in women who are treated with QT prolonging drugs. These findings may therefore enable us to permit and to incorporate hormonal factors into the restratification of arrhythmic events in LKTS, and importantly, a large community, a large proportion of people are now currently treated in community with QT prolonging drugs, and we now know, know that those hormonal factors may affect their propensity for arrhythmia. This finding can also potentially in the future personalize new hormonal-based intervention for the management and reduction in the risk of congenital and drug-induced long QT syndrome, their risk for the development of ventricular arrhythmia. We now need to look more carefully into the mechanism, possibly in the community, whether there are some polymorphism that further affect this type of interaction between sex hormones and arrhythmic risk, and we want to look for more clinical risk factors, whether there's fluctuation during the, the menstrual cycle and during other periods of changing sex hormones may affect clinical events and the risk of sudden cardiac death in both women with congenital long QT syndrome and women are treated with QT prolonging drugs. Mm -hmm.